You are listening to the Beyond Canon podcast. This first episode starts our Beyond Canon podcast. And who better to explain the project's background than its director general, Tobias Niklas? For those who are not acquainted with him and his work, which is almost impossible if you are not working in the fields of Christian Apocrypha, here is a brief biography. Tobias Niklas, Doctor of Theology, was born in 1967 in Burg Lengenfeld, a small town around 25 kilometers from Regensburg, in the eastern part of Bavaria. He studied mathematics and Catholic theology at the Universität Regensburg, received his doctorate at the Faculty of Catholic Theology in 2000, followed by his habilitation four years later. From 2005 to 2007, he was professor of New Testament studies at the Faculty of Theology of the Radboud University Nijmegen. Since 2007, he is professor of exegesis and hermeneutics of the New Testament at the Universität Regensburg. Tobias Niklas is research fellow at the Department of New Testament Studies at the University of the Free State Bloemfontein, South Africa. Since 2018, he has been in charge of the Center for Advanced Studies Beyond Canon at the Universität Regensburg, and since 2019, he has been adjunct ordinary professor at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. He is editor and co-editor of several important series and journals, including Wissenschaftliche Untersuchungen zum Neuen Testament, Jahrbuch für Biblische Theologie, Zeitschrift für Neues Testament, Novum Testamentum Patristicum and Deutral Canonical and Cognate Literature Studies. His main research interests are Christian Apocrypha, Johannine Literature, including the Revelation of John, the reception history of the New Testament and questions of Jewish-Christian dialogue. Now, Professor Nicholas, thank you for introducing this new podcast series with this interview. Let us start with a few basic questions. First of all, your Center for Advanced Studies Beyond Canon is all about Christian Apocrypha. Could you please briefly explain the term to those listeners who are not acquainted with it? Thank you, Stephanie. Actually, this question is not so easy to, uh, to answer. Um, everybody who has to deal with uh, New Testament Apocrypha or Christian Apocrypha first has to face a series of prejudices. The usual prejudice is Christian Apocrypha are unsuccessful texts which wanted to be part of the New Testament canon but didn't make it. Texts which are of a lesser theological quality and texts which are not interesting for any kind of historical purpose. A anybody who works with a historical critical approach thus is distanced from working with Christian Apocrypha. That's why for a long time they only played a very marginal role and in New Testament and early Christian studies. The main focus was always on patristic authors, Augustine, Origen, some of the great men, men <laughs> of late antiquity and their theologies. And the main focus of, of New Testament studies was much more on historical Jesus, Paul, and a few other texts than on these many, many writings. If I ask one of my students, one of my better students, how many Gospels do we have? They usually would say we have four Gospels, we have one book of Acts, Pauline letters, etc., etc. But in fact, we have not just four Gospels, the four Gospels of the New Testament, we have perhaps among 35, 40, 50 Gospels. And all this depends on how we define the term Gospel. We have not just one book of Acts of the Apostles, we have dozens of books of Acts of the Apostles. We have not just one book of Revelation and Apocalypse, we have dozens of Apocalypses, and most of them are not very well known. So the classical definitions of New Testament Apocrypha is these are texts which are of more or less the same genres as the genres we find in the New Testament or in the Bible, uh, but did not make it into the New Testament. Usually there is a kind of a borderline because as long as they are seen as competitors to the New Testament writings, with the closure of the New Testament canon in the 4th century, there's usually a borderline that people, that the classical definitions by Schneemelcher and others say after the 4th, 5th century, there is something like a limit of the production of Christian Apocrypha. I would say 
we should go beyond these limits if we want to really understand how things were going on. So my idea of Christian Apocrypha is that these are texts which can be related to the Christian Bible, to texts of the Christian Bible on an intertextual level. Some of them represent genres of the, which we find in the Christian Bible and some of them develop them and some of them even come from different uh, genres. So it's not a collection or not, not something like an anti-Bible or a counter-Bible. It's a universe with a center, with an intertextual center of the Christian Bible. And I would say this universe is still growing, partly because of new findings and partly because of production of writings which can be labeled apocryphal even today. You mentioned Schneemelcher's definition of apocrypha that most of our listeners might be acquainted with when they have been dealing with apocrypha in the past. But of course, this is not representing the state of the art anymore, as you already explained. Has the view on apocryphal text changed in, let's say, the last 20 years? If I talk about my own background, uh, when I did my doctorate and uh, my postdoc studies, my habilitation studies, and when I started to be interested and work with uh, apocryphal writings, everybody around thought this would be the end of my career, <laughs> working on these kind of, of texts, the Gospel of Peter, the Anon, Gospel on Papyrus Egerton, etc., etc., working on apocryphal hermeneutics was 20 years ago seen as something like an outsider's approach. Now things have completely changed during the last 20 years. We have now many of uh, new publications, for example... New collections by Tony Berkey and Brent Landau opening a whole new world of partly late antique, medieval, apocryphal writings. And perhaps the key in, uh, initiative was some 25, 30 years ago by a French group, the so-called ALAC, who started to read apocryphal writings from different angle, taking these writings more serious. And their key publications was, I think, on the whole a 2,500 volumes book, the Écrit Apocryphe Chrétien, uh, starting 1997 and then going on in the 2000s, opening the world of, of Christian Apocrypha, transcending borders, taking some serious, not just for the classical questions, but also for the questions of creating something like a new understanding of early Christianity, creating new paradigms of understanding of early Christianity. The classical paradigm is the paradigm with, with which I also grew up, though that we have something like a tree, uh, the tree of orthodoxy going back to Jesus Christ and the apostles themselves, and then a few lines, heretical groups, marginal heretical groups producing other views and perspectives. But during the last years, we have seen that we have to work with different images, different images like, for example, the image of a horse race, different groups representing the horses in a race and only one of them making it. But even these horses are not something like stable entities. These groups are not something like stable entities, but changing and uh, being uh, in mutual exchange with each other. So my own image is that we have the idea of a, of a dance party with many, many different partners coming together. And what we as historians see now is just snapshots from different perspectives, moments, minutes of this, of this big chaotic party. And what we have to do is bringing order into our images of this complex past. The next thing is, and this has to do with that, the prejudice was uh, for a long time, the Christian Apocrypha represents something like Volkstümliche Religion or folk religion. So a kind of a lower approach to Christianity. The idea that we have on the one hand the big theologians, which are the real ones who know what Christianity is all about, and then the people who do not really understand and represent a lower kind of Christianity, a lower kind of theology. But the point is... We learn, increasingly learn in how far even the so-called great theologians participated in this kind of folk approaches. Uh, if I look in my, into my own piety, I, I'm also on the one hand a theologian and on the other hand part of a world where I try to understand my life and try to make sense of my life and intermingle different traditions and ideas with each other. And the approach which is re related to this is the approach of a so-called lived religion. So the religion which is really lived by people 
And this is not something negative, but this is something which tries to show how real people in their real conflicts, in their real life, make sense of their life. And this is perhaps also my own key questions behind my approaches, how to understand or to understand how real people with their real struggles use different traditions, use religious traditions to make sense of their lives. Before we proceed, a brief note for our audience. You can find all bibliographical data in the YouTube description of this podcast episode. Um, Professor Nicholas, your answer clearly reflects that you have been thinking about dealing with writing on Apocrypha for the last 20 years. You already mentioned that it is not you alone, but that it's a whole group of people that's working on these questions. When did the idea arise to initiate this huge project you are leading now, which one might describe as the junction of different scholarly developments you now um, explained within your last answer? The idea did not arise at the university and it did not arise at my table. It arose some five, six years ago during my holidays in Serbia, which is one of the countries which I like very much, with many friends I have there. There is a whole uh, group of medieval monasteries in middle Serbia, in a wonderful scenic landscape. You go through the countryside and finally end up, for example, in the wonderful monastery of Studenica. Evening, dark, and there are lights in, on the mountains. At this time, it was not very touristic. We were the only guests there. We arrived there with a certain mood hiking uh, during the next days and so on. And of course, I visited several times the wonderful uh, church of the monastery of Studenica, which is fully painted with uh, medieval frescoes, fantastic medieval frescoes, which are now a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. One morning, I attended a service, and um, at the end of the service, a strange ritual started. I thought the service was finished, but waited a little bit. I don't understand uh, the language. People waited. And in this church, there are several coffins. Coffins of saints, which are also members of the so-called Nemanjit dynasty. This is the foundations dynasty, 12th, 13th, 14th century of an independent Serbian empire, medieval independent Serbian empire. And many of these kings or uh, relatives of kings uh, were for a certain part of their life important for uh, the dynasty. And then in the later parts of their life, they became ascetes, monks and so on, and lived in the monastery or close to the monastery. The coffins were opened and people went around the coffins where you could see the relics of these signs in the context of a church uh, with all the frescoes on the one hand telling the story of Jesus Christ and his passion, but also full of images of saints. So the representation of the church, let's say the Serbian church diachronically, starting with the story of Jesus Christ and then the presence of all the saints and you are a part of the whole thing in between. And then the group, the people... Uh, who were attending the service, went around, touched and even kissed the relics of the Serbian saint kings. I was deeply touched, but the even more important thing was later, we had a, a, a Serbian family with us staying at the, at the monastery. They had a little son. I think his name was Alexander. He was a friend of my, of my youngest uh, boy. And uh, Alexander's father told to his son, look, This is the Valley of Kings of Serbia. Here is the presence of the Holy Kings of Serbia. Here you can understand what our country is. But you have to touch the coffins. You have to smell the holiness, etc., etc. This man never read ancient Christian literature, I think. Perhaps the New Testament, of course, but not late antique ancient Christian literature, but all this sounded like a quote from homilies of John Chrysostom at Martyr's Days in Antioch. So the interesting point is, 
I saw in this context there was a completely same structure of what of 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 events of memories, of material culture, of liturgy, of stories, making sense for a certain group that we found in homilies where John Chrysostom wanted to bind people from the villages around to the church or the identity of the church of Antioch in his time. And this, of course, started me thinking about whether it is possible to find comparable structures in Antique, late antique literature, uh, in apocryphal literature, not just by chance, but whether this is something which which you can find in uh, in a broader parts of apocryphal literature. My first main finding was that we have the same structures even in Bavarian Catholic pieties, at least partly uh, still left. And then I found that we can find these things in uh, Egypt, in Ethiopia, and in many other parts of uh, late antiquity. But the first results of my findings were published and discussed in different contexts in the 2016-17 years. And what is interesting for me are aspects of the ideas of Pierre Nora's idea of lieu de mémoire, uh, a concept which shows, it has the idea that there are Kristallisationspunkte, focal points of memory, which are used by different groups for a creation of their identity. And these lieu de mémoire uh, are something which are not just spaces, but can be uh, represented by traditions, by places, by figures and so on, which are important for the self-understanding of groups today, but also in earlier times. 2017, my friends and colleagues here in Regensburg, Harald Buchinger, liturgical sciences, Andreas Merkt, patristics and Christian archaeology developed a project based on some of these impulses. 2018, a massive funding by the DFG, the German Research Foundation, helped us to establish the Center of Advanced Studies Beyond Canon at the Universität Regensburg, where we invite fellows to do their own research for up to one and a half years related to our overall ideas. Your Serbian experience uh, very clearly um, explains why you are following a very unique approach when it comes to dealing with Apocrypha and that you are very often crossing borders between lived religion um, and academic um, treating um, of uh, these topics. So... During the first two years of the project, um, he brought more than 80 junior, senior, adjunct and honorary fellows to the center to work on, discuss and present their projects. As a last question of our first part of this uh, podcast, we will uh, continue it in a second part, is what are the main premises that tie together all those different scholars from different fields? We have two main assumptions. First of all, even if the 4th and 5th centuries may have brought important changes for big parts of the Christian movement, or better, the different groups of Christ followers, the production of texts, which reasonably can be called Christian apocrypha, did not simply stop. Instead, in some genres, it seems to have even exploded. While we know about five apocryphal acts of the apostles written before the 4th century, dozens of writings related to the apostles or apostolic figures and their companions in different parts of the world were produced after the 4th century. The same is the case with apocryphal apocalypses, both texts focusing on the end of the world and otherworldly journeys. Other genres, like the so-called apostolic memoirs from the post-5th century Maya Faisit, Egyptian church, developed anew, and partly only in the Islamic period. Our fellow Alin Suchu wrote a very helpful introduction and overview hereto in his 2017 publication, The Berlin Strasbourg Apocryphon, a Coptic Apostolic Memoir, so a kind of a new gospel genre. Several of these writings are now available in English translation in Berkey's second volume of the New Testament Apocrypha. We are now stopping here for um, closing the first part of the interview and um, we will 
continue the interview in a second part when we are going to um, focus more on the different dimensions of the project and the future aims of Beyond Canon. Thank you, Tobias Niklas. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Canon podcast. 